Here's a typical on the road conversation. A bunch of people gathered together and somebody says, wow, man, it's amazing here. And then the seasoned traveler pipes up and says, dude, you should have been here 10 years ago. All this was just forest. You could pick mangoes off the tree. There were monkeys milling around. Well, don't be that guy and rain on everyone's parade. It does them no good to know it used to be better. But I feel your angst, seasoned traveler. You have a point. There is an interesting theme here. You do some exploring and find a picturesque little spot way off the beaten path. It's beautiful, serene, an unspoiled, genuine gem. Word slowly leaks out until one day it hits a tipping point. Once that tiny slice of paradise hits the guidebooks, it's on a countdown to doomsday. Soon the masses will arrive. Bungalows, cafes, English menus, bus and boat tours sprout like mushrooms. Now it looks like every other Southeast Asian beach town. A generic backpacker dump soon to become a string of resorts. Unchecked, the tourism machine steamrolls a place until it's discarded like an old piece of flavorless gum. This idea has struck me hard here in Sihanoukville, where I traveled over 10 years ago. None of this was here before. There were just a couple of fishermen shacks, really nobody on the beach. Out here at... <laughs> but seriously, Sihanoukville has changed dramatically. Now usually if I find that kind of picturesque, underdeveloped spot I'm talking about, and I make a special memory there, I will never go back. Leave that memory alone. Go somewhere new. On the other hand, what if a higher authority stepped in early, before mass tourism arrived, and set up a structure that protected the integrity of that special spot? Keep the golden goose from being squeezed to death. To explore that idea, I traveled deep into rural Cambodia to find an innovative, one-of-a-kind project launched by an alliance of the national government and a prominent NGO. The lonely road passes lush fields. Water buffalo, my only companions, until I finally reach Koh Kong. There's something fundamentally poetic about a river crossing, isn't there? Some people go down to the River Jordan, Caesar cross the Rubicon, and I'm going to the other side of the Jeep Bad in my Cambodian adventure. On the other side, I meet Martin Layfield, project manager of a concept called community-based ecotourism. Even if it makes the guidebook and people come in masses, we won't be seeing jet skis and parasailing on the river, ATVs tearing up the little creeks, full moon parties, all that jive. Uh, probably not. Uh, the, uh, we want people to come and enjoy uh, the full moon but in a village setting. We want people to come and enjoy the river, but uh, without jet skis, they can take a traditional rowing boat and catch freshwater lobsters in the nighttime. Those are the activities which we're trying to promote here in keeping with the traditional Cambodian culture. Martin hooks me up with a community director who leads me back to a spot called Butterfly Island. Right from the get-go, it feels like my kind of destination. Wow, what a special place. And I should be able to come back here 10 years from now, and I won't be like that home alone kid. Oh no, what happened to my tropical paradise? It's ruined. Now, more tourists will come, but the community has a structure in place that will channel that tourism energy into something that's beneficial to them instead of detrimental. And they put a cap on numbers so it won't jump off the rails and trample everything that makes this place what it is. And it is something. Koh Kong is the perfect retreat from all the dissonance of the modern world. I can explore, kick back with a book, and goof off without a care in the world. And 20% of tourism money goes into public works projects. On a loose day, I jump on a bike with a local to see where that funding is really headed. A fun little path led us towards some of the more remote communities. 
there a basic but evidently necessary bridge project was coming together and a small school had been built. A little more rural than my academic experience, but it brings back memories. So tell me which one were you? Back in grade school, high school, I was this guy, but way back there. And then as I got later into college, I became this guy, but up here. I think the more life experience you accrue, the more your intellectual curiosity grows, which is why I'm a strong advocate of taking six months to a year off between high school and higher education, if that's your calling. When school is in full session, it's a rancorous affair. I get an invitation from the U.S. Peace Corps and Wildlife Alliance to join their special program day, and I jump at the chance. Through drawings, games, and other shenanigans, the kids are slowly instilled with a sense of value for the forest and all the animals that reside therein. They're given an understanding of Cambodian law and filled with a sense of civic duty to enforce it. Sometimes I'm truly helping, and other times, oh well. It's a total blast to be with such an ebullient group of kids. In a sense, the entire country is coming back to school, with trepidation. Class has only been back in session since 1980, and the recess that preceded it was long and dark.